morning, Austin Oaks Church. My name is BJ Ferguson, and I'm one of the pastors here on staff, and we are so thankful that you decided to join us this morning. Here at Austin Oaks, we are simply about Jesus. We want you, we want your neighbors, we want your workplace, we want everybody to meet, know, and follow Jesus. And we believe that when you meet, know, and follow Jesus, that changes everything. Over the past several weeks, we've been able to engage you guys and our community in, in unique ways. We've been able to serve lots of people because of your generosity. We've served the Clint Small Middle School. We've served over at Seton Southwest. We have been able to do some amazing things because of your generosity. We've also been able to equip you guys through our morning devotionals that are online. But we wanna let you know about one other thing that has been amazing. We have seen God show up in really unique ways. And that is on every other Thursday, we've been having a prayer and worship night in our courtyard. And we wanna invite you to come here where I am right now to join us as we pray to God and ask him to do mighty things. And we worship him and proclaim him as the creator of the universe and just thank him for all that he's done at 7.30 on Thursday, this coming Thursday. We want you to come, we want you to bring your family. You can bring your lawn chair, we're gonna spread out. We're not gonna be right next to each other. We are gonna get together as the church is called to do and we are gonna worship the one who changed everything. So we are so thankful that you've decided to join us. If you wanna know more about what's happening here at Austin Oaks Church, we invite you to go to our website, austinoakschurch.org and you can find out more about meeting together on Sundays in our home group sites. We would love for you to look into that. Or you can look at how you can give online. You can find that all on our website. Thank you again for being here. We look forward to meeting with you in person and shaking your hand and giving you a big hug someday. Um, and we are gonna pray that that happens soon. We love you guys. Let's keep worshiping. Hey, good morning, Austin Oaks Church family. Pastor Brandon Ziske here. So thrilled and humbled and honored that you invited us into your home this morning. Um, before we dive into God's word, um, I wanted to give um, a little bit of an update as to some things. I almost use this time as a pastoral moment, if you would. Just real quick on the COVID-19 side, um, we have been saying from day one that our methods and our strategy and how we're going to come back as a church is to be safe, smart, and gospel-driven. Um, so we just recently found out this weekend that someone, um, two of our staff members, someone um, new people who were recently tested positive for the COVID-19 and those folks who were tested positive, they're asymptomatic. And so they're the staff people who were in contact with them, um, they're immediately being tested and we're waiting the results of that to know what our further plan of action will be as a church. But out of abundance of precaution, um, we decided to stay in vain with what we've been saying, to be safe, smart, and gospel focused. And so part of that is, um, we, again, we shut down our offices so we won't be meeting as a staff on campus, but we also shut down our studio audience for at least two weeks until we know. We just want to be cautious. Um, and some other things that we're doing in our ministry, we'll keep you posted and up to date on that. Um, we're not nervous. We're not anxious. People are feeling good. So we just want to encourage you to be mindful of um, the heartbeat of this while we're doing this is that we want to be very focused on the gospel, not preventing um, other folks from hearing Jesus. And we want to love our neighbors. So we want to be safe, smart, and gospel driven. And what we do, um, you can still enjoy the worship services online. And we also really encourage you to join one of our house church communities in this season. Okay. Just because again, we temporarily paused the studio audience doesn't mean we can't gather together as a church. So I want to encourage you to do that. Um, secondly, I want to speak into what's happening around um, our world, um, specifically in the United States and, and even real local to our city, Austin. Um, there is a lot of unrest and turmoil and chaos all over the place. And, and you just can't get yourself away from media and all the things that are being reported and all the pictures and all of the news and all the things. There's a lot of hurt. There's a lot of confusion and there's a lot of anger. There's a lot of fear. A lot of people feel that their voices aren't heard and in many cases they, they aren't heard. And those voices are demanding change. And the reality is their voice is crying out and it's the same thing that we cry out when we talk about the gospel, that change is to be found in equality, in justice, and in unity. Now as believers, 
those who've said yes to Jesus as believers, we stand with them in, as it relates to fighting for justice, equity, and unity. There have been way too many stories with too many names that have been forgotten when we, where we quickly realize that justice isn't always upheld and that equity still hasn't moved beyond an aspirational value. What's recently happened to George Floyd and even Mark, Mike Ramos in Austin was wrong, as well as numerous other stories. Now, the platform that I have, that God has given to me, to steward here at Austin Oaks Church in the role as lead pastor, and I want to talk about that. One of the major components of this platform is to shepherd people to being gospel people. We say here at Austin Oaks Church that we are simply about Jesus and that our mission is to help people to meet, know, and to follow Jesus. And so listen, if you are part of our church, you have a platform. And your platform is to be part of this church, to be an ambassador of Jesus, to share his message and to uphold it by how we act. And this message is one of reconciliation. That is the message of Jesus Christ. First, there's reconciliation with God. And that's where we look at the cross and the empty tomb. And as we seek this reconciliation with God, we, are quick, we quickly realize that we are moved then to be able to reconcile relationships with other people. When we look at God and we understand the heart of God, we realize that all people are on the same page. All people are created equal. All people are created in the image of God and all people come to Jesus the same way. So friends, listen, I want to make this crystal clear. If we were to put our actions in line with our beliefs, following Jesus would always lead us first and foremost to the heart of God to his love for people. And then what would happen out of this connection of seeing the heart of God, it would lead us to corresponding actions that are motivated by the love of God and the love of people. Micah chapter six, verse eight says this. I totally, oh, there it is. I'm sorry, I totally had a moment. Uh, what the Lord has told you is good, and what does he require of you? To do what is right, to love mercy, or to love justice, and to walk humbly with your God. When we look at Jesus, he embodied his life. Just look at the 12 disciples that he picked. All different scopes of life, all different backgrounds, all different opinions, and the fact that they got together was rather a miracle. We see Jesus engaging racial tensions, moving beyond that, is seen beyond nationalities and ethnicities as he engaged with a Samaritan woman. And even when James and John wanted to call lightning down from heaven to destroy a Samaritan village, Jesus said, no, that's not the way of the cross, right? And we look at the early church. We see how the early church was learning how to love justice and how to walk humbly. They were surprised when the gospel was going to the Gentiles, when the gospel was going to the Romans, when even Ethiopians were saying yes to Jesus, Samaritans, when they were called to love their enemies and even to love slaves. They were amazed by these things. Jesus even said that to be a disciple is to be a peacemaker. And the journey of a disciple to learn how to be a peacemaker is first an inward journey of asking questions of our hearts and being willing to pay the price that we will have to pay in order to seek peace. Not just talk about peace, but to actually seek it. As gospel people, we have an obligation to all people because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're told in Romans chapter 13 that we owe a debt. As believers, we owe a debt. And that debt is a debt to love people. We're called as a church to move towards marginalized people intentionally because the reality is it doesn't happen accidentally. So before we pray, I want to make something crystal clear. Governmental systems can and should and ought to fight towards justice and equity. They should do that. Courtrooms, they can help to fight towards justice, equity, and they should. Even protests, if done right, they can help the movement towards justice, equity, and unity. But the reality is, at the end of the day, none of these systems, none of these options can change the real problem, which is the human heart. That's where sin lies. That's where evil lies. That's where racism lies. That's where prejudice lies, is in the human heart. 
Human systems and institutions are band-aids, temporary solutions. But listen, only Jesus can fix the real issue. Only the gospel can fix the real issue. Jesus lived a life of justice, fought and proclaimed and showed equity and love. And it's only through the power of the gospel that he can empower us to do the same. So church, listen. Peace starts here first. To be a peacemaker means we need to do an internal inventory of ourselves. We need to ask questions. We need to do some hard checks of ourselves. Learn, engage, listen, ask questions. Don't assume you know everything about every situation. Don't assume you understand everything. First and foremost, go to the Gospels. Learn the heart of Jesus. Because at the end of the day, only the gospel can provide what is really needed in our time. We are in a series called Be Still and Know. And Psalm 46 reminds us, okay? It reminds us that nations are in chaos. And the kingdoms crumble. God's voice thunders and the earth melts. The Lord of heaven's armies is here. The God of Israel is our fortress. In verse 10 it says, Be still and know that I am God. Friends, listen. Our good friend and brother Josh Broccolo is going to preach an amazing message in a few moments. Because what we need is we need to hear his voice. And in the midst of all the chaos and all of the noise and all the turmoil around us, God's voice is still speaking. So please join me now, wherever you're at, just to pray. To pray and to seek and appeal to God's mercy in this time. But really, at the end of the day, to pray for the gospel to go out like never before. Father, we come to you in humility. We are told clearly in your scriptures that what you require of us to pursue justice, to do good, and to walk humbly with you. You created all people, and all people you love, you love them all, and the gospel is for all people. The gospel is the great leveler of all things. So Lord, I pray that we would see this circumstance, this situation with your eyes. Lord, I pray that we would, we would long for heaven in such a way that, that we wouldn't just want to leave here But in our longing for heaven, we would get these glimpses of what is awaiting us. That, Like it says in Revelation 22, that the streams of life that come from the throne in the new Jerusalem is the healing of all nations. Lord, we pray that your kingdom would come and that even before you do come and restore all things, Lord, that we can begin to build your kingdom and to fight for justice and equity and unity and understanding that all people, all people will come to life the same way. And it's going to be through Jesus. So, Father, I pray that starting with us, your children, those of us who believe that we would be um, real honest with our own hearts and to be courageous enough to ask you to seek our heart or to, to reveal the things in our hearts, to see if there's any sinful way inside of us. Even as a church, Lord, would you lead and direct us? So Father, we pray for your voice and your spirit to guide, lead, shepherd us because that's what we need. And I pray that you would anoint Josh now with your words, that there would be deep um, encouragement and deep compassion and deep change through your spirit this morning. We're here because of you, and Lord, we know that we are called here on mission. We are your church, your body. So Lord, give us ears to hear and the courage to be obedient. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, good morning, church. I'm Josh. Uh, you might not recognize me. This is my first time on this side of the camera on a Sunday morning. But if this is your first time, welcome. We're glad that you're joining us here today. We're here at Austin Oaks Church. We are simply about Jesus. All that we do is so that you can meet, know, and follow him. Um, but again, if you don't recognize me, it's it's because it's the first time here. Um, you might have thought, possibly, that I was Pastor Chad, but I'm not. I slouch a little bit more than he does. We may be similarly follically challenged, but I'm not Chad. And uh, I'm certainly not Brandon, as you saw him come up earlier. Uh, if you were in the room with us, you'd be able to see that I'm wearing shoes, not flip-flops. So that's another dead giveaway there. Um, I have sat under a lot of preaching before, and it seems to me like if you're going to preach for the first time, you have to show, it's mandatory to show a picture of your family. So I brought a picture of my family here today that you can see. Um, I've got my wonderful wife, Samantha, and my two awesome kids, Oliver and Josephine. This picture was taken back in Thanksgiving of last year. If you were to see us today, you'd notice something a little bit different. We actually have another child on the way. Penelope Lynn is coming in just a couple months. Um, and I have no idea what to expect. Um, as a father of young kids, I'm still learning. Um, I'm sure if, if you have any experience, you're learning as well. Um, but you know, when you first have kids, you, there's, there's a stereotype, right? When you have a young boy, he's going to be rough and tumble. He's going to be digging in the dirt. He's going to be jumping off the couch, doing all this crazy stuff. You have a young girl, you think, oh, well, she's going to be delicate and organized and enjoy tea parties and dresses. And that kind of went out the window with our kids. Um, Oliver's definitely a little crazy. He's, he's definitely a ball of energy. But he's the type to look before you leap, where Josephine, our younger uh, daughter, she is, if she, if she wants something, she's going to go 100% for that thing, no matter what's in her way. If gravity is in her way, it doesn't matter. She, she's going to go for it. So that's been a, a learning experience for me. Um, and it shows itself in a number of different ways, like the way that we discipline our kids, the way that we show love to our kids. Um, I have to, I'm learning that I need to tailor that based on how they experience those types of things so that they can be more effective. But regardless, I'm not here to talk to you about parenting this morning, but I do think it has something to do with the text that we're going to be looking at today. So let's go ahead and jump right in. We're going to be looking at 1 Kings chapter 19. I've got a nice chunk of scripture here, so forgive me if I, if I talk too fast, but uh, I'm going to go ahead and read the first 18 verses of the chapter here. So it starts out, Ahab told Jezebel, this is the king of Israel, told the queen of Israel, all that Elijah had done. Elijah is the prophet who's called out by God. Um, how he killed all the prophets with the sword. Now, these are false prophets. These are prophets of a pagan god, Baal. Um, then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then he was afraid, and he arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he asked that he might die, saying, It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. And he lay down and he slept under a broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. And he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the mount of God. There he came to a cave and lodged in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I've been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And he said, Go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and with a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. 
And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I've been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only am left and they seek my life to take it away. And the Lord said to him, go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, you shall anoint Haziel to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat of Abel Mehalah, you shall anoint to be prophet in your place. And the one who escapes from the sword of Haziel shall Jehu put to death. And the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha put to death. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal and every mouth that has not kissed him. So let's pray. Lord God, thank you for your word. Thank you for revealing to us who you are through the scripture. Open our eyes this morning to see you in this story. Open our ears to hear from you. Lord, we need to hear from you, and we know that you are speaking through your word. Lord, we want to be more like you through the power of your spirit and show the greatness of your love to those in need. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so that is quite a story and I'm kind of dropping you into the tail end of Elijah's ministry here in chapter 19 of 1 Kings. If you don't know Elijah, I'm gonna give you just a little bit of a backstory. Um, As a prophet of God, God is the one who called him to speak to the people of Israel. So this, in the Old Testament, this was before they had the Bible, and so God would speak through particular people known as prophets. Elijah was called by God to be a prophet in Israel. And all throughout his ministry, it was absolutely filled to the brim with miracles. The first time we see Elijah in chapter 17, uh, he prays that it wouldn't rain in Israel. And there is an absolute famine throughout all of Israel. He lives by a river and drinks water from the river. He gets his food from ravens that God sends. He sends him bread. God feeds him through ravens. Okay, the next time you see him, he goes into a town and meets a widow who's about to die. She's on her last bit of oil and flour. Her husband's gone, so she doesn't have, in that time, the husband was primarily the breadwinner, and he's out of the picture, so she's about to die. She tells Elijah, I'm going to make one more piece of bread, and then my family is dead. And Elijah prays, and as she makes the bread, the oil never runs out of the jar. The flour never runs out of the jar, so she continues to make bread and make bread. So there's another miracle of Elijah. Elijah comes back to the city and the widow's son is dead. So she's distraught. She comes to Elijah. Why did he have to die? Elijah prays and her son comes back to life. Okay. And then the biggest thing, if you know anything about Elijah, you might've heard this story. Elijah, at, at the time that Elijah was the prophet over Israel, Israel had turned their hearts from God. They were serving another pagan God called Baal. So Elijah comes before Israel and he challenges this God, this pagan God, Baal. He says, I'm going to call you to task. Let's have a contest in front of everyone, okay? We're going to set up these two altars. We're going to sacrifice a bull on either one of them. And we just want your God to show up because I'm going to show you the power of my God. My God can beat your God kind of a thing. So they set up the altars, the prophets of Baal come and they, they slaughter the bull on the altar and they're praying for hours and hours they're praying to Baal, trying to get his attention. In fact, the Bible says they even start cutting themselves, trying to get the attention of this pagan God. Nothing happens. So now it's Elijah's turn. Ever the showman, Elijah takes jars of water, pours it all over the bulls. He makes a little moat around the sacrifice. He's saying, this is not gonna be a a natural kind of fire that I'm gonna start. This This is God, watch this. Immediately, Elijah prays, and immediately God sends down fire, and the sacrifice is burnt up. It says that the water was licked up. Even the rocks themselves are burned because of the greatness of God, how God showed up in that moment and burned the sacrifice. So then um, the people rise up against the prophets of Baal, and Elijah's riding high, right? He just performed in his life, in his ministry of miracles, he just performed the greatest miracle so far. God showed up in a powerful way in front of everyone. Okay, so then is this story, chapter 19. 
And where does it start? Well, it starts with the king, excuse me, the queen of Israel threatens Elijah. Okay, well, he just showed all the people that God can show up in mighty ways and bring down fire. What's one person? Yeah, she's the queen, but what's one person? Well, how does Elijah react? He's afraid. Okay, he's afraid? That seems a little bit out of character, but we'll see why in just a second. Um, because Elijah's afraid, he leaves. It says that he goes to Beersheba. If you're familiar with the geography of Israel, Beersheba is the southern tip of Israel. Um, throughout the Old Testament, sometimes people refer to Israel from Dan to Beersheba. Dan is the northernmost tip. Beersheba is the southernmost tip. The only reason I bring that up is because it's showing Elijah is leaving Israel. Elijah was a prophet to Israel, but he's afraid. He's leaving his post. In fact, it says that he leaves his servant there. That means that Elijah is done. He's hanging up his hat. He's saying, his right-hand man in ministry, he's saying, look, I'm, I'm done with the ministry. I've done all that I can. I've done all these miracles. I've called down fire, and these people still aren't turning. They're threatening my life. I'm done. I'm out. I'm not a prophet anymore. And he leaves his servant there and goes into the wilderness. We can see how distraught Elijah is by his prayer in the wilderness when it says that he comes before God and he asks God for something. He asks God to kill him. He's done. He's not only done with his ministry, he's done with his life. Uh, he tells God, that he's no better than his father's. Now this could mean a couple different things. This could mean, I'm no better than my fathers who are dead in the ground. I'm as good as dead. They're no use to you, I'm no use to you either. This could also mean, I'm as good as my fathers, the prophets, because he sees that he was in the line of prophets to Israel. And all the other prophets, though they tried to bring revival, the people still turned. They still serve other gods. I'm just as useless as all these other prophets. Lord, kill me now, because there's no point in me going on. And how does God respond here? God, when Elijah asks for death, God gives him rest. That's really interesting. In this life full of miracles that Elijah led, now God calls Elijah to slow down and to rest, to be still, and to know that he is God. Elijah might have thought that he wasn't going to wake up again, right? He just prayed, God, kill me, and goes to sleep. But sure enough, he does indeed wake up. And what does he see and hear when he wakes up? Well, there's an angel of the Lord who's there, and he says three words to him, arise and eat. Now, it's really um, important to note hear what God says and what God doesn't say. God doesn't come with a lecture. Elijah's depressed. He's down and out. He's out of the ministry, and God is not rebuking him. He's not saying, Elijah, come on, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. It's not that bad. Get back in the fight. No, no, no. Before God has something to explain to Elijah, he just meets his needs. He gives him a nap and a meal. In fact, the angel here, it says that the, the cake of bread had just been baked. The angel had baked this bread for Elijah. We see God, dare I say it, serving Elijah in the hour of darkness that he's up against. And I think that's because God made Elijah and he recognizes the complexity of our human experience. We're not just computers that God can download a new uh, set of data, right? Elijah, just be better. Just get up. Just do this. No, he recognizes that Elijah needs rest and a meal. So Elijah takes another nap, right? And what, what happens when he wakes up? Well, the angel says the same thing. Arise and eat. But then he says one more thing. He says that, what does he say here? <laughs> he says, arise and eat for the journey to come. You will need strength for the journey to come, okay? God is not done with Elijah. There's something that's coming. 
You're not as good as dead, Elijah. There's more for you. Uh, this is interesting to me because often people think about the God in, or excuse me, God in the Old Testament as a God who's harsh, who's stern with his people, and God in the New Testament as a God who's loving and gracious. And that is not the case. Our God is unchanging. And here we see how gentle and how kind and how loving he is with Elijah and how encouraging he is towards Elijah. Elijah, there is more. There is a journey to come and you are gonna walk in the strength that I give you to press forward. Elijah, you may be down, but you're not out. There's more. And maybe you can relate to this. Maybe there's a coworker, maybe there's a family member you've been praying for, you've been laboring over, you've been having conversations, spiritual conversations with, and it doesn't seem like anything is changing. God, why is this not working? I'm, I'm holding up my end. Why aren't you holding up yours? But God comes in kindness, he comes in love, and he comes in encouragement, pushing Elijah forward. So where does he guide Elijah to? The wilderness. Uh, Elijah's out of ministry. He's going through the desert, the wilderness. And he's in there for 40 days. This brings to mind a, a few different stories throughout scripture. You think the Old Testament, Moses was in the desert for 40 years, but that was a curse because Israel had turned away from God. Um, another time you see this wandering in the wilderness for 40 days is Jesus. And when Jesus wanders in the wilderness, he actually claims victory. It's a time of great temptation for Jesus where he's fasting and Satan comes and he tempts him with all these different things. And Jesus shows victory over temptation, over the devil and over sin. Elijah's not really on either of these extremes, but you see him here walking through the wilderness for 40 days long. And you have to think what he's going through, okay? He left his post, he left the ministry, he's no longer a prophet, yet God still said that he's gonna do something with him. I have more for you to do. But also God has not told him where he's taking him. God hasn't given him his answers. And in this state, Elijah is walking for 40 days. I don't wanna skip over that. <laughs> so often I get frustrated if I don't receive an answer from God in 40 minutes, but 40 days of going on, and it doesn't show that God says anything. God's not speaking to Elijah. But I do believe that Elijah is seeking out God. And the reason for that is because it says that he was going towards Mount Horeb. You might not recognize Mount Horeb. You might recognize it by its other name, Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai is where God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses, and where Moses had asked God, I want to see you face to face. And God says, I can't show you my face because you're going to die if you see my face. It's too glorious. You can see my back. And after that amazing experience where God reveals himself to Moses, Moses comes off the mountain and his face is literally shining with the glory of God. So this is where Elijah is going to. He wants that experience of God. He wants to see his God. And so he's going towards Mount Sinai. So finally, Elijah comes to Mount Sinai. He finds a cave where he's going to stay. And sure enough, God shows up and asks Elijah what he's doing. Um, Elijah's reply shows his mindset, right? He spent 40 days in the wilderness thinking over what had brought him to this place. And he tells God, hey God, I've served you with all that I've had, yet Israel hasn't turned back. He sees himself, Elijah sees himself in the line of Moses, right? I'm a prophet of the Lord and these people aren't turning. Elijah contends that he is alone, that everyone else has forsaken God, but he has pressed on. He has done what God has told him to do. And now the people are trying to kill him. So God tells him to go out to the side of the mountain. Elijah comes out of the cave and God sends a powerful wind. This wind is strong enough to tear at the mountain, to rip down some of the rocks of the mountain. I mean, this is, this is an amazing thing. I mean, think of a tornado and God tells him to come out and see this thing. 
I can only imagine how excited Elijah is after his 40 days in the wilderness. He finally sees the power of God, the ferocity of God coming in this wind, and he's ready to contend with God. But God's not in the wind. Okay? So then God sends an earthquake. The ground begins to shake. Okay, Elijah's ready. This is, this is the time when I'm going to meet with the Lord. But God's not in the earthquake. Finally, there's a great fire. Now this has to be it, right? Elijah just saw God come down as a fire when, uh, during the contest with the prophets of Baal. This is, has to be my God. He comes in this consuming fire. No, God's not in the fire. Then the scripture says there was a low whisper. Other translations say that it's a still, small voice. What is that about? Why is there a whisper? I think the whisper is exactly what Elijah was not expecting. He was expecting God in the great, in the grand, in the miraculous. But God comes in a low whisper. And I think these pictures, the wind and the fire and the earthquake, was to drill into Elijah's heart that yes, God is powerful, but he's doing something different. He's doing something that Elijah is not expecting, and he comes as a whisper. And I think that because of what God reveals to Elijah next. Okay, God gives this grand picture through the fire and wind before he answers Elijah. Be still and know that I am God. So Elijah, after hearing this whisper, understanding, hearing God in the whisper, he wraps his cloak around his face and he prepares to meet God at the entrance of the cave. So again, Elijah pleads his case. God, I've done all that I can for you, but these people won't listen. I'm the only one left who serves you. And now they're trying to kill me just for doing what you told me to do. So how does God reply? He tells Elijah three things, and these are so important. Don't skim over these. The first thing that God says to Elijah is to anoint a king over Syria. Okay, if you know anything about Syria, you know that they are also a pagan nation. They're actually enemies of Israel. They cause a lot of trouble for Israel. So why in the world would God want anything to do with Syria? Why would he want to, to anoint a king over Syria? It's to show Elijah that God works through everything. He works through good people. He works through bad people. He works through calamitous circumstances, and he works through wonderful circumstances. The good and the bad, God is still doing something. God's plan involves more than just Israel. When Elijah thought that with the fire and this grand spectacle, that God's people are going to turn and come back to him, God says, no, I have something better, something more wonderful. You don't understand it right now, but I'm working something. And I'm going to work it through my means, through the king of Syria, if I have to. So the king of Syria is the first one that Elijah's called to anoint. The second person is Jehu, king over Israel. So this is a promise to Elijah that Israel is going to continue, that God's people are not done for. Yeah, they're rebelling right now. They've turned their hearts from God, but there is more for them. Elijah, you, you see this king Ahab, this evil king, anoint this new king. The, this is not the end of Israel. Yeah, I'm going to work through Syria. Yeah, I'm going to discipline my people, but this isn't the end. I am a faithful God, and I will see you through. I will see my people through. So God's plan involves more than just Israel. Finally, the third thing that God tells Elijah is to anoint a successor, Elisha. He's telling Elijah, Elijah there's more going on than just your life. You can see, you've done great things, Elijah. You have followed me. You have 
done great miracles of God. People have seen the power of God through you because of the work that you've done. But I am doing so much more than what you can do. I'm using your life to bring about something so much more glorious than you can even understand in this moment. Yes, you want great things for Israel. You want Israel to turn back to the Lord, and that, that is a good thing. But I'm working something even more glorious than you can see, than you can know, than you can understand. Something more wonderful than just your life. Something far bigger than what's contained in your ministry. Uh, for all my Back to the Future uh, fans, you're not thinking fourth dimensionally. There's so much more than just what you're doing. God is telling Elijah, Elijah, if you were the hero of the story, then this whole story would have to be rewritten. This isn't about you. This is about God and what God is doing. You see, the hero of the Bible is not a prophet. It's not Elijah. It's Jesus. It's God's son. The salvation of Israel wasn't to come through the ministry of Elijah. It was to come through the sacrifice of God, through Jesus Christ. Elisha couldn't understand that. He, he didn't know that. What he wanted, again, was a good thing. He wanted to see God's people turn back to him. But God was working something greater than he could have imagined. God's son was to come into the world and to seek and save those who were lost. Not those who had turned back. The scripture says that Jesus died while we were yet his enemies. We wanted him dead. And that's who God came to save through his son, Jesus. Jesus is the hero of the story, not Elijah. Sure, he couldn't see that at the time. He wanted good things. But God was saying, Elijah, there is so much more than what you can see, than what you can know. Finally, he tells Elijah, yes, I'm going to judge Israel. You don't have to worry about it. You're not a part of it. Anoint these other people. I have 7,000 people who are set apart, who have not worshiped Baal. When Elijah felt so alone through his ministry, God says, Elijah, don't worry. I have my people set apart. There's more that you can't see. I have set these people apart for my name. Israel's going to continue. Prophets are going to continue to come. I'm going to work through all of this. It's more. It's not only different than what you want. It is more than what you want. It is better than your plans because I am God and I am working these things together. Elijah, cease striving. Be still and know that I am God. When I think of that, you know, this, this series that we're in, be still and know that I am God, um, a question comes to mind. How do we know that he is God? Um, you know, we, we read these stories and we see what he does, but more important than what God does is who he is. And we can see who he is. We can see his character through the things that he does. So I just want to take a look real quickly at where God shows up in this story, where God speaks, where he acts, and what that tells us about who God is. So the first part of the story where we see God is when Elijah prays, God, kill me. And what does God do? Elijah asks for death. God gives life. Our God is a life-giving God. He comforts us. He meets our needs. He serves us. He is gracious towards us, his enemies. Next, he tells Elijah, Elijah, there's a journey for you. You need to walk in my strength, in the food that I will provide you to go forward. Our God is an encouraging God. 
God tells us that there is more to carry on, to press on in his strength. It doesn't look like our striving. It looks like our trusting in him. So on the mountain of Sinai, how does God show up there? He reveals himself in a multitude of different ways. We get to see the expansiveness of our God. Fire, wind, a low whisper, strength, power, awe, fear, gentleness, service, hospitality, nearness, kindness. Our God doesn't change, but he doesn't always work in the same way. Sometimes he shows up in all of his power. Other times he comes in that still, small whisper. But that doesn't change who our God is. He is all of these things. He's more than our minds can contain. Finally, God shows Elijah that he's working something greater than Elijah can understand. God always gives us what is good. And Elijah, in the midst of his depression, he wanted to die. He was ready to give up, to throw in the towel and to die. God gives him what is good. And we can see in this story, sometimes that's hardship. Sometimes that's 40 days in the wilderness where we're seeking out God. We just want to see his face. But look where that brought Elijah. That brought him to see God and experience God in a new way, not just in power, but also in rest, in solitude. He was able to speak with his God. God will give us what is good, even if that means difficulty for us in the moment. Our God is greater than we can understand, and he works in unexpected ways. You know, when I think of the times where I'm so certain that God is going to do something, that he's going to heal a loved one, that he's going to change the hearts of my friends, sometimes that are, those are the moments where it's so clear to me that God doesn't work on my timetable. He doesn't, he's not at my whim. He's not some genie that I can ask and, and he'll do exactly what I want. He's not a vending machine. He's so much greater than all of that. And his plan is perfect. And we get to rest in that. We get to be still and know that he is God. He knows exactly what we need. He knew what Elijah needed. He knew he needed rest. He knew he needed encouragement. He knew he needed to speak with God, to understand. And our God will give that to us. We just need to cease striving, be still, and know who he is. Know that he is God. So I want to invite you um, as we transition to a time of prayer and worship. Um, I do think it's really important. Now that we've seen God, now that we know more about our amazing God who works things greater than we could ever understand, let's come to him, let's pray to him. And I want to join you guys. Um, if you're in a home site, I'd encourage you to get together as a group and pray together. Um, we're going to pray over a few things. I'll lead us in prayer, and as the band plays some music, I want you guys to pray along with each other as well. I'll come back, and I'll lead us in another prayer, and we'll do that just a few times, because I think let's meet our God. Now that we've seen him in his word, let's come before him together. So let's pray. Lord, you are an awesome God. You are greater. You tell us that there is more. And Lord, today, this week, our hearts are burdened. Um, we see so clearly the injustice that surrounds us. And God, it may not be anything new. 
throughout all of history, we see how um, there is injustice. We, we see so palpably our own sin nature. But God, we ask that you would come and you would bring justice, that your justice would roll down like waters. God, show us where we need to be to fulfill that. God, what we need to do, how we can speak love and truth into the lives of those around us. But God, we ask that you would meet needs because you know what we need more so than we do. So I invite you all to pray that God would come with his justice and his love and that we as his people would show that love as well. Let's pray.